happy today uh, to have uh, Alex Rutsaska. So Alex uh, received his PhD at Harvard in uh, physics in 2017, and then stayed stayed here to to do a uh, a junior fellowship. And uh, he's currently affiliated with the Black uh, with the Gravity Initiative at Princeton, but he's actually physically located very near us uh, still. So his talk today will be about the black hole photon ring. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Great, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak here again. It's always a pleasure. And today I'm very excited to tell you about the latest developments in the story of the black hole photon ring. So this story has to start with the first image of a black hole ever that was released last year by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Um, this is an image of M87 star, the supermassive black hole at the center of the neighboring galaxy M87, which is located about 50 million light years away. And this black hole weighs about 6 billion times the mass of the sun, and its size is roughly comparable to that of our solar system. But even though it's so big, because it's so far away, it looks tiny in our sky. And um, it, in fact, taking an image of it is akin to taking a picture of an orange on the surface of the moon. So to be able to get such an up-close shot is already a, a remarkable achievement, and it's very exciting. And as time progresses, we'll be able to take hopefully sharper and sharper images. And so then the question arises, what do we expect to see once we can achieve even higher resolution in this image? And the answer, based on many, many, many simulations that use GRMHD, General Relativistic Magnetohydrodynamics, which is the state of the art best guess as to what we think happens around the black hole, generically produces images that look like this. And so you can see there's a very striking feature in these images, um, namely a sharp, razor thin ring of light, which has now been uh, dubbed the photon ring. And to em I want to emphasize this in many simulations of M87, as you vary the parameters, as you vary the details of the astrophysical source, you always tend to get such a ring. And so this raises a number of obvious questions. What is the origin of this ring of light? How can we actually better resolve it? And what can we learn from it? So those three questions will be the subject of this talk. And um, just to give you quickly the answers, it turns out that this photon ring is always present because it's a universal, that is to say, matter independent feature of general relativity. It always appears because of gravitational lensing, because of the presence of the black hole, and is independent of the fine details of the astrophysical source around the black hole. And because it's governed by general relativity, this uh, ring has a rich and intricate subring structure which is completely characterized by some critical parameters, gamma, delta, tau, that we have derived in the last year. And it turns out that this photon ring is present not just in the image itself, but also in its Fourier transform, which is what we can actually directly sample experimentally using an interferometer. And it turns out that the, the subrings in the photon ring are not just visible in, in the image, but they're also producing strong signatures on very long interferometric baselines. That is to say, when your interferometer is very large, and we think that we, we could actually detect some of the, the subrings by going to, to space and doing space-based interferometry. And so this part of the story uh, was understood more or less last year. But the new thing I want to talk to you about today um, is that the shape of this photon ring is actually itself remarkably insensitive to the astronomical source profile. And actually measuring it could therefore provide a very stringent test of gravity and general relativity in the very strong field regime where it hasn't been thoroughly tested yet. Okay, so I'm going to take 10, 15 minutes to review for those of you who haven't heard about the photon ring, what it is and, and what its structure is. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll shift gears and talk about an experimental proposal to measure its shape. Okay, so last year, um, there was this paper that came out. This is how I became involved with the story of the photon ring. Uh, it involved also many of you here at the Black Hole Initiative. And we, we started to understand the structure of this photon ring and, some, and the critical exponent gamma. Um, it was followed by work that I did with Sam Grala, in which we studied the other critical exponents and proved a number of things about curl lensing. And so um, the first few slides are going to summarize these results. 
So to understand the photon ring, we have to first talk about this region of space-time right near the event horizon that is now known as the photon shell. Now this photon shell is, is very unique to black holes. As far as we know, there's no other object that can have such a thing. It's a region of space-time in which gravity is so strong that light rays can be bent so much that they're essentially um, deflected more than a full turn and can execute multiple orbits around the black hole. Uh, so um, we can now describe some of the features of these bound photon orbits. And two of them are very simple. Um, namely, as the as a light ray orbits around the black hole, um, it executes orbits in the theta direction. So it bounces up and down, up and down. And we can ask how long does it take for it to execute one bounce? And that's called tau, the time, the time lapse incurred per half orbit, where a half orbit just means going from one side to the other. And we can define another parameter, delta, which is the azimuthal angle swept during the half orbit, so how much it goes around. Um, and I encourage you to go on Leo Stein's website, due to symmetry.com, where there's a really cool Java applet that you can interact with and see these um, bound photon orbits animated in real time. Um, and I should add that the shell shrinks to a single radius, a single sphere, when the black hole is not spinning. So that's the Schwarzschild black hole. But as the black hole spins up, the shell thickens um, until it looks like this at 94%. So this is a, a black hole with spin 94% of extra mass. OK, so light rays can orbit in this region. And because it's outside the event horizon, they can still escape. And so we can still receive them. But they're close enough, this region is close enough that the light rays are very strongly lensed. OK, so I've explained the photon shell and how light rays that are exactly bound have these two critical parameters, delta tau. And now I should mention that light rays that are not exactly bound, so if you're here, it's possible to aim a light ray in exactly the right direction for it to remain at fixed radius forever. But if you don't aim quite right, then the light ray will actually escape because these bound orbits are actually unstable. And it turns out that there's a Lyapunov exponent, which characterizes the orbital instability of these orbits. And roughly, it says that if you don't aim your light ray just right, it's going to uh, exponentially deviate in its radius. And the exponential rate of growth in the radial position um, is, is given by this Lyapunov exponent gamma. So now I've explained the three critical exponents that describe these geodesics, gamma, delta, tau. Uh, so these are properties of, of these bound or nearly bound orbits in the photon shell. And we're going to translate these properties into properties of images of the black hole. So before we do that, I just have to introduce one more concept, which is that of the critical curve. So if you imagine looking at a black hole in your sky, so the origin here in the sky is just the line of sight to the black hole, well, then um, there's a region in which light rays that are, that are aimed directly at the black hole or slightly outside of the black hole will end up getting pulled in. So in this region here, we expect the, the light rays that we shoot to enter the black hole. But of course, if we aim far away, then the light rays might get somewhat deflected, but it'll escape back out to infinity. And in between these two regions of capture in here and escape out here are the critical light rays, which are those that are aimed just so that they actually asymptote to these bound orbits that get stuck around in the photon shell. So as you aim a light ray closer and closer to this critical curve, it's going to actually start orbiting more and more in the photon shell. And when you're exactly, exactly, exactly on this curve, your light ray is going to become exactly trapped. Although, of course, these orbits, again, are unstable. Now, uh, this is really the warped nature of space-time uh, brought to, to life on your, on your sky because every angle around this ring is actually a different radius in the geometry, which is pretty warped. But um, there's a lot to say about this for, for, for today and, and for the purpose of understanding the photon ring. All that we really care about is the fact that near critical light rays, so those that are aimed near this critical curve but not exactly on it, can execute multiple orbits around the black hole. So uh, this leads me directly into describing the lensing properties of curved black holes. And the key point is that because light rays near the critical curve 
can circumnavigate the black hole multiple times, they go around and, and traverse the emitting matter around it, around the black hole several times, that means that a single light source, such as this orange dot here, can connect in principle to the same observer along multiple light rays. And this is something that we've analyzed thoroughly in the past year. And just to give you a flavor of, of how it works, let me explain the simplest example where we're looking at an equatorial disk from the pole of, of the black hole. So we're an observer on the spin axis. We're looking down an, at an equatorial disk. And there are many sources here that light up. And the point that I want to make is that as in flat space, you get a direct image from light rays that, that come directly at you. That's, those are depicted by this n equals zero blue curve. But unlike in flat space, because of the strong lensing by the black hole, there are also light rays that go down, execute n equals one half orbits around the black hole, and then reach you. And then there are those that do n equals two half orbits, and so on. And in fact, in principle, um, every light source is connected to an observer by infinitely many light rays that execute an increasing number of half orbits around the black hole. And, and to understand the net effect of this, um, let's imagine that we're seeing an mth image of the disk that looks like this from light rays that executed m half orbits. The point is that the m plus one image of the same disk that we that will receive from light rays that execute an additional turn um, will be exactly the same. It's the same image of the stuff around the black hole. It's just lensed even more. And in fact, this lensing is completely described, as I mentioned before, by the three critical exponents of, of the bound orbits. And the precise relation is quite simple in this case. There are three effects. First, the image gets squeezed in towards the criti critical curve or demagnified by an amount e to the minus gamma. So the Lyapunov exponent characterizing the critical instability also tells you about the demagnification. And then the image is also rotated uh, by an amount delta. That should make intuitive sense. And it's time delayed by a time tau. And here I'm showing you, depending on the spin of the black hole, what these parameters are. So the demagnification is actually greatest at low spin and decreases with spin. Uh, but the rotation increases with spin from exactly pi in Schwarzschild to almost 3 quarters of a turn at extremality. And the time delay is always roughly on the order of 15 n. OK, so because there exist these nearly bound orbits around the curved black hole, it can actually produce multiple lensed images of the same source. And all these images are related by these critical exponents. So now we can actually explain the photon ring because well, what is an image? So in order to produce an image, we have to ray trace into the geometry and figure out what the emitting matter around the black hole is. So that is to say, we pick a point on the screen, and we want to compute the, the intensity associated with that pixel on the screen. So what we do is we take that pixel on the screen, and we shoot a light ray back into the geometry. And we, we, we do that using the null geodesic equation in the curved space time. And whenever we interact with matter around the source, we're supposed to use the equations of radiative transfer, which tell us that, which tells how to load or unload photons from the light ray. So for each little in, infinitesimal affine length d sigma along the light ray, we update the number of photons on the light ray according to whether we're traversing matter that emits with some emissivity j, or we can also unload photons if they're absorbed by, by, the, by the matter, uh, by interactions with the matter according to an, emiss to an abs absorptivity a. And so if we do that for all the pixels on the screen, um, that's called ray tracing. And we obtain a ray traced image of the matter around the disk. And now on very general grounds, putting, to, putting this together with the lensing properties I outlined, what do we get? Well, I told you that um, the light rays that execute n orbits will appear at a distance d from the critical curve, which goes like e to the minus gamma n. That's the demagnification effect. But if you invert this equation, that means that if you look on your screen at a distance d from the critical curve, the light rays will execute a logarithmically divergent number of half orbits in the geometry. OK, so the closer your pixel is to the critical curve, the more the light ray traverses the geometry. And for optically thin matter distribution, this implies 
also in mild logarithmic divergence in the observed ring intensity near the critical curve because a light ray that completes n half orbits through the emission region roughly collects n times more photons along its path. That's this relation here. And so the photon ring is simply the bump in the photon intensity, which contains this logarithmic divergence that's due to the near critical orbits. Now, of course, in the real world, uh, this divergence doesn't occur. It's cut off by uh, optical depth effect. But nonetheless, for M87, at least, the striking feature remains visually prominent in many ray traced images of uh, GR MHD simulations. And here's a, an example with this video. So let me see if this plays. Great. So here you can see a, a 3D animation which shows a number of light rays first that don't turn around very much around the black hole and these don't necessarily appear very close to any critical curve. But as you increase the number of half orbits executed by a light ray, well, what you find is that they're forced because of this demagnific demagnification effect to appear closer and closer to the critical curve on your screen. So these are the n equals one guys that execute one half orbit. And finally, in this video, we're also going to show n equals two half orbits or a full orbit around the black hole. And these light rays are forced to appear even closer to the critical curve. And so when you take the totality of the light rays, well, you have the n equals zero guys, which does give you the direct image of the disk. But superposed on top of that, you have the n equals one light rays, the n equals two light rays, which give you additional demagnified images of the source around the black hole. And this additional light creates an additional light ring, which contains additional images of the source. So that's the photon ring. And this photon ring substructure is actually confirmed by numerical simulations and state-of-the-art models, where if you take a horizontal and vertical cross-section of this simulated image, you get this kind of an intensity profile. And actually, if you zoom in on it, you can see that there are photons that are emitted that, that only execute n equals zero orbits. So these are the, the direct guys. But then on top of that, you can see n equals one, n equals two, n equals three. And then it just gets exponentially sharp, so you can't see it on this plot anymore. But it's always the same profile, the same image of the matter surrounding the disk, just lens and demagnified and superimposed on top of the original image. OK, so this summarizes roughly um, the theoretical developments in the story of the photon ring. So just to reiterate, general relativity predicts that embedded within black hole images lies a thin photon ring, which is itself composed of a sequence of self-similar subrings, with each subring a lensed image of the main emission indexed by the number n of half orbits executed around the black hole. And this lensing effect of curved black holes is completely characterized by three critical exponents, gamma, delta, and tau, which control the demagnification, rotation, and time delay of successive images, respectively. OK, now there is a lot more to say about the theory. There are very interesting implications to maybe time dependence signals and other features of black holes, which are actively being explored. But uh, for today, I'm going to stop here and, and shift to um, what I think is, is a very exciting recent development, which is an experimental proposal to image the shape of the black hole photon ring that I made together with Sam Grella and Dan Maroney over the summer, and um, which will be the, the subject of the remainder of this talk. And um, in order to make to explain this, I need to give a little bit of background on the interferometric signature of a narrow ring, um, which has been worked out in these two papers here. So um, let me briefly explain how we actually take black hole images. So the technique that the Event Horizon Telescope uses, for instance, is called interferometry, or very long baseline interferometry, VLBI. And so how does this work? Well, a radio interferometer, what it does is that it consists of many elements or, or telescope dishes um, that together measure the, their local electric field. And then by taking an appropriately sh time shifted and average of these electric fields, um, the, the interferometer constructs the so-called radio visibility, which in general is a complex quantity. Now, um, this radio visibility turns out to be the Fourier transform of the image of the source in the sky. And the way this works is that each telescope pair samples a, a, a particular point U in the Fourier transform of the image. And that point U is given by the projected separation um, 
between the telescopes in the plane perpendicular to the line of sight to the source as measured in units of observation wavelength. Okay, so if you're the event horizon telescope and you want to take an image I of X of M87 in the sky, what you can do is have many, many telescopes on the surface of the Earth. Um, and the more telescopes you have, the more um, U's you have. So the more different baselines you have, the baseline is, is this quantity U. And by sampling the complex visibility V of U with, many with many, the many baselines that connect your telescopes, you're, you can basically sample the Fourier transform of the image better and better, and then take the inverse Fourier transform and reconstruct the image. Now, the key idea in last year's paper with Johnson and all, and, and many people here at the Black Hole Initiative, was that actually, if you go to very long baselines, so if you look at very high frequency components of the images for your transform, the fact that you have this very sharp, thin ring feature in, in your image means that you should get a strong signal from it on, on very long baselines. And indeed, we expect a clean signature of the ring to dominate this, the, the Fourier transform, at least in this regime, where um, the, the Fourier component or baseline is large enough to resolve the fact that there's a ring. So it's, its diameter is resolved, but not its width. So it looks very narrow. And what we showed in this paper was that for a, a perfectly circular or almost circular ring, um, we, get a, we do get such a clean signature. And uh, we get a signal with a period which encodes the ring diameter. So let me give you a little bit more detail about how this works. Um, and in particular, we have to generalize this to non exactly circular rings because it turns out that the photon ring is not a perfect circle. So this is a general uh, formula, which was derived recently by, by Sam, which gives you the, um, the uh, complex visibility, that is to say the Fourier transform of an image can, containing only a narrow curve in the sky. So in the regime where you can resolve the diameter of this curve, but not yet see its width. So it looks very thin. And uh, what this formula tells you is that the complex visibility looks like, like this. This is here I'm plotting the amplitude. You get a, a ringing signal in this regime with again, a period that tells you about the diameter of the, the curve at the corresponding angle in Fourier's, in the Fourier plane. Okay, so this V is a Fourier transform. So it, it, it's a 2D Fourier transform of a 2D image. So we can describe it using polar coordinates in the plane. And at a given angle, polar angle var phi in the, in the visibility plane, which is the Fourier transform of the image, um, on long baselines U, we get this ringing signature. This is the precise formula. And it depends on the projected diameter and projected centroid of the curve at that angle. So the projected diameter is just, you can think of it as the shadow that this curve would cast on the screen if it was lit from behind at that angle. And uh, the centroid is a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, but it'll become clearer in the next slide what I mean. And the point I want to make is that there's a relatively simple formula for the visibility that you expect to get from, from um, a thin curve in the sky. But um, I want to, to separate the phase. So this is a complex quantity. And it's useful to separate the, the phase part of, of the complex visibility from its amplitude. And the reason is that experimentally, it's very hard to measure visibility phase, roughly because an interferometer has to find a fringe, so it has to do coherent measurements. And um, the phase is very easy to lose track of because if you have a photon that comes at you directly, but then you have a photon that comes at you and bounces within a drop of water in the atmosphere a couple of times on, on its way to you, now these two signals are no longer out of phase. So it's very hard to keep track of visibility phase, but the visibility amplitude is comparatively much easier to see. And so it's interesting to focus on the visibility amplitude uh, by itself because technologically we think it's more feasible to measure that. And if we take the amplitude of this complex quantity, it turns out that the centroid disappears. And we find that the visibility amplitude encodes only the, the projected diameter. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. And uh, before I move on, let me just point out a funny feature that, um, of course, the circle is a special 
closed convex curve. Um, it has constant diameter, so d, the diameter is just twice the radius, and um, no centroid. But there exist many curves of constant width. This was studied by um, Gauss centuries ago. Um, and a, a, a classic example is the Rouleau triangle, which has the same constant diameter as, say, the circle, but a non-zero centroid. And so its shape looks very different. And the point I want to make with this is that um, visibility amplitude alone cannot tell these apart. So if you have an interferometer that's only capable of measuring visibility amplitude, you can only see the projective diameter of a curve in your sky, of a light bright curve in your sky, but you, but you can't really tell the centroid. And so you can't actually tell, say, a circle from a Rouleau triangle. So that's a very interesting feature of how interferometers work. Um, and in, in this paper here, we worked out a whole theory of how to think about this. And it, it's, there's a whole calculus that allows you to decompose a shape into a part that's purely a projected diameter and a part that's purely uh, a centroid motion. It's very interesting. I encourage you to look at it. There's some beautiful math. But for the purpose of, of the experiment that we're proposing now, all I need to tell you is that for an ellipse, the projected diameter at an angle var phi is given by this formula, and there's no centroid motion. So that's all I'm going to need to use uh, for the rest of the talk. And so now having given this background, I can finally uh, address the main question experimentally, which is, can we test gravity? What can we learn by measuring the photon ring shape? And so really, there are two questions, uh, two sub-questions that we have to address. The first one is, well, I told you that the direct image that you get, this n equals 0 image, is just an image of whatever is around the black hole, and it's completely astrophysics dependent. But all the higher n images are um, have a structure that follows completely from general relativity because they're just lensed images of whatever the direct image is. And the separation ought to also occur in Fourier space where um, the direct image will tend to be diffuse and so appear on short baselines corresponding to small Fourier components of the image. But the, but the sub rings should correspond to very long baselines because they're very narrow features in the image. So uh, that's our expectation, but does it actually happen in realistic models? That is to say, can we test GR even in principle? If we had a perfect detector, could we see this effect in, in the physical system? And the second question that we have to address is, is it possible to achieve the experimental precision that's required to carry out an interesting test? That is to say, can we test GR in practice? And so I'm happy to report uh, encouraging results on both fronts. So uh, for the first question, the answer is yes. We made many models of M87. I'm going to show you one now. And what we found is that the, the diameter of the photon ring can always be measured from the interferometric signature on long baselines. It's a clean signal, at least in the simple models that we've looked at. And we always find the diameter of an ellipse, regardless of the astrophysical details of the source. Um, and as to the second question, uh, can we achieve the experimental precision? The answer, I think, is yes, because the basic requirements um, for such a mission can be met with a large inflatable ap aperture in space, together with a next generation of, of detectors that we think could possibly be built in the next few years. Um, and in the paper, we made a forecast for the experimental precision, and we found that we'd be able to test the, the um, Kerr hypothesis that the black hole is indeed described by the Kerr metric to a, an incredible precision um, at the sub sub percent level. Okay, so let me give you some details as to uh, how we can answer this more, more precisely. So for the first question, what we did was to generate about 100 models in which we just took um, equatorial matter around the black hole and we assumed that it's stationary and axisymmetric which is akin to looking at time averaged images. And we picked various source profiles for the emissivity in the disk. So this is one example. Then we ray traced the image of this disk to obtain um, uh, well, an, an image. And, and we looked at the intensity across the image. So here we're looking at horizontal and vertical cross sections of the image. And um, you can see that this looks quite similar to the cross sections in the state of the art GR image simulation that I flashed earlier. So once you've done the ray tracing, which is already 
quite involved, you then have to Fourier transform to obtain the visibility. And this is a very hard uh, numerically intensive step. Um, and what you find is that on short baselines, so the small Fourier components of, of the image, you get this kind of signal, which we, we checked um, in, in all our models uh, can be made compatible with EHD observations. So these data points come from the April 2019 run of the EHD, uh, April 2017, sorry. Uh, and then we went to very long baselines, so the, the very high Fourier components of the image. And we checked that wants to go to, say, about 300 giga lambda, which would correspond at the observation frequency of uh, 230 gigahertz that the EHD presently has. This would correspond to a, a distance between the Earth and the Moon. What we found there is this super clean signal, which we then fit to the uh, predicted formula for the visibility amplitude. And uh, fitting this formula to these um, wiggles allows you to measure d sub phi. And what we found is that regardless of where you look um, in this range of large baselines, it, it's a robust result that you can always fit d phi very well. That is to say, in principle, if you had a perfect detector and you could really see this image to arbitrary precision, you could infer from this period d, d phi. And you, what you'd find is that it's always an ellipse. So we regard this as the GR prediction for M87. Um, now, of course, to address the uh, question of whether this is experimentally realistic or not, we have to talk about measurement error. And so we did a forecast um, of the precision for an experimental measurement where we assume some level of noise of 0.14 millijansky for measurements around 230 gigahertz uh, in, in 32 1 gigahertz channels. There are a lot of experimental details, uh, which you can look to the you can look up in the paper. This is actually a really involved, complicated, subtle um, calculation, but I, I, I can't explain everything in detail in the talk. I encourage you to look at it. I'll just briefly explain what we find. So supposing that at a given angle um, around the ring, the Fourier transform produces this clean signature, in the real world, we'd only be able to expect, we'd only expect to be able to measure these kinds of points. So what we're saying here is, suppose this is the true signal, but we have a satellite in space with reasonable technology, we're not actually going to measure exactly the signal because of noise, we'd be able to get these kinds of data points that you see in the scatter plot. And if you look at this, when I first saw this, I thought, wow, this is really not very encouraging. But it turns out that um, from, this, from these messy data points, you can run uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, simulations and infer a probability distribution for the diameter of the ring at every angle around the ring. And we, we did this with a lot of mock data. And we uh, found this uh, strongly multi-peak distribution for the, for the diameter of each of these, uh, of, of the ring at every angle from each of these baselines. And when you put it all together, so every vertical line on this plot is, is showing these spikes. Um, so these spikes here correspond to uh, zero degrees. These spikes here correspond to 90 degrees. When you look at these probability distributions together, you can basically find the projective diameter around the ring with very high precision. And you can fit it to the, to the predicted um, shape, which is that of an ellipse that I've shown here. Um, and so you can do this. We, we think you can do this experiment in principle. And um, you should be able to measure these peaks and then fit this functional form to them. And either you would find a successful fit, in which case you would report a, a confirmation of GR at the precision uh, associated with the root mean square deviation between the data points and your model. Or if you just can't fit to these data points, so it's your chi-squared is not near one, say, then um, the, the associated p-value of the chi-squared test tells you um, to what confidence level you can exclude GR. OK? Now, there's a big problem here uh, with uh, fluctuations. So in, in these models, we assume stationary axisymmetric emission, which is akin to looking only at time averaged images. And you know, I'm going to be very upfront about this. We have to understand um, uh, what happens in the presence of astrophysical noise. And that requires adding noise to time dependent models to simulate realistic uh, turbulence in the accretion flow. 
the, the one check we did in this paper was to uh, add random noise to um, the, the, the signal and check that if we carry out enough observations of the visibility amplitude and by averaging them away, by averaging them, a lot of the noise goes away and at least we can see the same nulls. So here there's about 20 uh, different noisy observations of the photon ring. The point is that when you average them, you get a black curve, which has the same nulls as the noise-free green curve. And so all that we care about is the periodicity to infer the ring. And so this looks like a, a robust measurement. But again, we, didn't, we don't know what the true level of astrophysical noise is. OK, so uh, to summarize, this is the, the big picture for the test of GR. The idea is to have a, a space interferometer with an element that's roughly at a distance uh, corresponding to that of the moon. So we can measure the, the signal on about baselines of 300 giga lambda. And so as the, as the dish orbits around the Earth in the plane perpendicular to M87, at every angle, it can measure the visibility amplitude, see those wiggles. And from those wiggles, we can measure the period, which gives us the diameter of the ring at every angle. Um, now, this might require, um, the, to, to do this experiment well, you might have to wait for several orbits and measure multiple times the diameter at every angle to do an average to get rid of the noise. But in principle, if you do this enough, you ought to be able to infer the photon ring diameter at every angle of r phi. And so for our forecast, uh, we got this kind of data point. We did it several times, and it always looks roughly like, like this. And so here you can see the, the simulated mock data against the GR shape prediction, which is um, the shape of an ellipse. OK, so um, let me just make a few quick comments and caveats. Um, there's been a lot of discussion so far of the critical curve, uh, including in my talk. Now, the critical curve is a theoretical curve whose shape is known exactly, but is not observable. What is observable is the photon ring and, and its subrings, which asymptote to the critical curve, but whose shape is not exactly known. And in this paper, we were looking not at the critical curve, but at the actual observable, which is the photon ring shape. And to emphasize that these are different, what I'm showing here is um, the shape of the photon ring inferred from uh, simulations with the same black holes, with the same parameters, same mass, same spin, same observer inclination, but different astrophysics source, astrophysical source profiles. And, and that leads to three different uh, photon ring diameters, which are shown here with these colors. And all three are different from each other and also different from the critical curve, which is shown in, in dashed black here, which is not observable. So the, the new thing in the story is to look at the actual physical shape of the photon ring. And, and, and what we found is that it's, a, it's an ellipse. But to emphasize, um, the parameters that appear in this functional form, so the, the size of the ellipse, um, depends not just on the parameters of the black hole, but also the astrophysics. Because here, we have the same, we have different R1 and R2. These ellipses have different sizes, even though the black hole is the same. So what so what these values are depends on the astrophysics. The universal prediction from GR is that the overall shape has this functional form, which is that of, it, of an ellipse. And um, the statement holds uh, the envisioned uh, experimental precision. If you want even higher precision of one part per million or even 10 million, uh, you can add another constant here. Uh, so R0 plus this, which we call the circlips, and then you find that basically you, can, you can't see a deviation from the, the, the experiment, the photon ring shape and, and that of the circlips. Um, a couple other comments. This experimental forecast is currently at the order of magnitude level, and we need a lot more detailed modeling um, to improve it. And the critical thing, again, is the treatment of astrophysical noise, which our analysis hasn't uh, treated correctly or sufficiently. Uh, and the last thing is that this proposed mission is currently single purpose, but it'd be really good to think of synergies or other applications of a big radio telescope in space. And finally, let me make a point about whether, uh, about why this is even interesting, because many of you might think, well, why do we even need to test GR? We believe it works. Well, it's true that uh, we expect GR to fail, but only deep 
inside the black hole interior, and there's a priori no reason for it to break down outside. However, the, the Kerr prediction of the Kerr geometry around the black hole has not yet been directly tested with great precision, and it underlies a huge amount of astrophysics and also plays a driving role in theoretical physics. So I think it's good science to directly test the important assumptions that impact multiple fields. And a real test has to have the possibility of changing minds. That is to say, you have to, there has to be a possibility of being surprised. And um, many other ways of testing GR have to make assumptions about the astrophysics or the model. And if you don't measure exactly what you predicted, you can always say, oh, it just means I have to ship these parameters in this model. Uh, but here, because we're going after a simple universal prediction of general relativity, um, we have to see a ring with, a, with the shape of an ellipse. And if we don't see that, then GR is wrong and there's no wiggle room, which is why I think this is a very interesting test. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, so let's move to questions. So Avi, you have your hand raised. You can... Yeah, so I just wanted to encourage you to consider another dimension, which I guess you haven't discussed much, and that is the time dimension. So in other words, if you have a bright uh, spot uh, moving around, um, it would reflect itself in the and what you described in a time-dependent way that adds additional constraints on the theory, you know, and, and in principle, it can provide a completely independent test of GR in the sense that you're testing time scales for the different features in the, in the image. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's, that's a very interesting, somewhat orthogonal direction. And the dream would be to be able to do both. Right? Maybe if you have a very clever mission design, you can. I, but have you explored uh, how things would change in time if you had a hotspot, for example? Um, yeah, in fact, uh, well, with Shahar, Michael, um, and George Wong, we have a, a paper under review uh, currently by the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, which discusses some time dependent signals in autocorrelations. And I know a number of other people have written papers about this. Actually, George just had a, a numerical study come out last week about black hole glimmer. Um, so I think, I think you're right, that's the next frontier. In some sense, the time averaged images are easier to understand. And um, you know, I think we, at this point, we've thoroughly understood, I think, the, the theory of, of time averaged black hole images um, and, and understanding the time dependent structure of black hole movies is kind of the exciting next frontier in theory and possibly an experiment too. Uh, you know, we hear rumors of movies of Sagittarius A star. I don't, I don't know what the status is there. Uh, no, actually of M87, I just got a, a, a reporter approaching me about some new EHT results. So, so watch out uh, tomorrow or in the coming days for a news uh, release on that. Wow, cool. Okay, well, I, you're more plugged in. Uh, that's, thanks for the spoiler alert. Great. All right, uh, Masik, you're, you're next. Uh, right, uh, uh, Alex, that was a great talk, and I really regret uh, uh, in a moment like that that uh, we cannot uh, chat in person because I have many questions and comments, and I will have to limit myself. Masik, uh, I will happily meet you in person. What are you talking about? <laughs> we can go for a socially distanced walk. Yes, the problem is I'm uh, in Europe. Uh, <laughs> Okay, Maciek, I will not give you a first walk in person. That, that's, the, that's irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me limit myself to just a couple uh, quick uh, questions and, and comment, comments. So first thing is, is a comment, uh, not uh, a question you uh, mentioned at some point uh, in your talk, that this is a feature very characteristic to black holes exclusively. But it's not entirely true because a lot of these theoretically proposed mimickers of black holes uh, can, may or may not have it. Boson stars may have these sort of features, may not. Wormholes may have it and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, very good point, I'm sorry. I, I just meant in the realm of uh, theoretically accepted things that we know to exist. But he also said you have to be um, uh, yeah, 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 waiting yeah. to sorry, be surprised. I, fine, fine. Let, 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 I, I just meant, I, I think, I, this is a very interesting question, which came up last time I, I talked about the photon ring at the BHI. 
which is can a neutron star also have a photon ring? And yeah, it's compact, sufficiently compact, sure. Yeah, so what I had in mind w was that I, I think, um, you know, neutron stars, which can be very compact, nonetheless are not compact enough to have a photon shell because the, even I think in the most compact neutron stars that we know of, the, the radius of the star is still bigger than the- oh, A quark star, Alex. <laughs> a quark star. There are uh, other theoretical concepts, but uh, that was a, a, a minor comment. Uh, another comment, uh, another question. Uh, I will just limit myself to, uh, to, to, to that. Uh, are those orbits, these unstable orbits on this uh, photon shell, uh, are they actually per periodic? Meaning will photon hit the same uh, location and the same momentum at some point? Ah, that's a very good question. There's a measure zero subset of the photon shell uh, for which that is true. Um, and so it's, so the photon shell has multiple radii and for certain fine tuned radii, um, the a generic radius, these geodesics are um, ergodic. They really span the whole sphere. But, but if you tune the, the radius just right, the frequency of the polar theta motion and azimuthal phi motion, um, these two motions can have a harmonic ratio. And so then, then the light ray uh, no longer ergodically explores the whole sphere, but rather returns to the exact same point. And if you go to, the, to Leo Stein's website, you, you can wiggle the parameters and you can see this effect happen. Um, and it's been studied theoretically, um, Gen 11, uh, and friends wrote papers about this about a decade ago. Um, and on the observational side, I think George's paper from just last week uh, considers, this also addresses Avi's question, considers time dependent effects in the photon ring that could arise um, due, to, to, due to these um, exactly periodic um, bound orbits. Okay, cool. Thank you a lot. Thanks. Okay, Andy, then Ramesh. Yeah, so um, I guess I, I don't understand very well the, you know, the experimental apparatus that, that measures this, but I guess, so the Event Horizon Telescope got two or three orders of magnitude better resolution in the sky than, than anything before it. And so now this, so the, the deviation of the lips um, from a circle, I, if I remember correctly, is something like a percent or within an order of magnitude of a percent. But if you just see that it's not a circle, you haven't measured uh, general relativity because you have to see that it's an ellipse, right? You say it's a, from, it deviates from what you said until you get to one part in a million, it's still an ellipse. And that's a prediction between, you know, 1% and one part in a hundred, one part in a million, it's only an ellipse, uh, nothing else. So to see that it's only a lip, not, nothing else, you, you've, you've got to have some sort of precision that is three orders of magnitude better than what the EHT got. And you have a proposal for, for how you're going to do that. But my question then is, if you can get three orders of magnitude better uh, precision than the EHT, why can't you also, I mean, the EHT hasn't even seen the n equals zero ring. Wouldn't you hope to see the n equals one and n equals two ring with that kind of resolution? Why is this the thing that we would most want to see if we have a measuring apparatus that is a thousand times better than anything we've had before. Yeah, so we're, we're rapidly going to get lost in the weeds. I think to, to, to like carefully address this, it gets very subtle, but, but simply put, um, so the Event Horizon Telescope saw a ring. Um, it saw the n equals zero image and about 10% of the photons, that's e to the minus gamma roughly also Wait, what did I say? I meant to say that they hadn't seen n equals one. Did I? Uh, yeah. Right, right. You said yeah. n equals zero. So they did oh, see sorry. n equals zero. And, and part of the photons they got, maybe one in 10, also was part of the n equals one subring, but it wasn't resolved. Yeah. Um, so of course, if we can have a, a space interferometer um, and we send a satellite to 
you know, earth moon distances. So you can see the signal at a baseline of about 300 giga lambda. We think in that regime, um, you see the n equals two photon ring. I wasn't very uh, particular about specifying this. If you send your satellite closer, so you see somewhat shorter baselines that are between, you know, Earth baselines and, and Earth moon baselines, then you can see the n equals one uh, photon ring. Now, the reason that's somewhat less interesting is that the n equals one photon ring is not yet in the universal regime. So there isn't this prediction. Oh, within 10% of it. Right, but we want to have a very precise test. So the great, the great thing about the n equals two photon ring is that it's already deep enough in the universal regime that there is a very sharp prediction from GR for what its shape is. And then you might say, but well, why don't we go to higher end? The problem then is that it, it gets exponentially hard to measure it. So n equals two is sort of the sweet spot where you know, the distance is reasonable. There's still a lot of flux because the flux also decreases exponentially. So it, there's, it's, it's large enough n that you're in the universal regime, but small enough n that you have flux and can measure it. So that's why, that's why n equals two is, is interesting. I mean, you know- okay. Are you saying that you're gonna, you're gonna result, you're gonna see the, and you're gonna see the two sub rings before you, and you're gonna measure the shape? So we wanna measure the shape of the n equals two sub ring. Okay, but before you do that, you have to see the n equals two sub ring. Yeah, we have to see it and okay. seeing, seeing it. The n equals one, seeing the n equals one sub ring is fantastic, right? Seeing the n equals two sub ring is insanely interesting. I, I why, love are you, why are you putting, I mean, to see the two rings would be, would be um, I, that's already a test of strong field. It's a qualitative yeah. test. I love your enthusiasm. I completely agree with the sentiment. I think that the, the, the issue here is, it may well be that you can find a clever design that lets you see both n equals two, n equals one, and n equals one. I think the issue is more a political one, which is if you just see, you know, it's going to, if you want to have a mission like this, it's going to cost a whole lot of money. And you have to build a science case, which is why would you spend hundreds of millions of dollars or however much it costs to send a mission into space to see the ring? I mean, it's cool to see the strong lensing effect. But if for roughly the same amount of money, you can actually do a super precise test of general relativity in the strong field regime where it hasn't been thoroughly tested yet, that's a much stronger science case, I think. So I love the idea of seeing n equals one. I think that would already be amazing. I think n equals two is scientifically more interesting because we can do precision tests with it. Uh, whereas with n equals- I, I guess it sounds a little bit to me like you're saying we're, we're going to build this experiment. We're going to measure the mass of the Z by looking at the Higgs decay rates without mentioning that before you do that, you see the Higgs. See, okay, the photon yeah. ring is hugely exciting, right? Yeah, I agree. So you want to see n equals one and n equals two together. That's what you're what you're saying, or, or at least n equals. I want to see n equals one first. That seems like that seems like huge. I mean, as far as we know, I mean. You know the EHT. It could, it could be they could have seen just a swirling mass of glowing stuff around a quark star. It's so not. I, there's not too much. Yeah. Okay. I okay. I, maybe I got myself in trouble saying that. But yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a great experiment. I, I, I but you know it isn't. We haven't seen really GR. But to see the to, to see just the n equals one ring is GR. The fact that there's bound orbits of photons. I, I, I agree with you. I think seeing the n equals it's one ring huge. would be- It would be the best strong field GR we've ever had. I, I, well, there's also LIGO, right? So, I mean, we're, we're not in the business of competing with LIGO, um, but this but is- In LIGO, way. we're not, in LIGO, we're not, um, we're not resolving it. Well, LIGO has similar ways. It's of like, LIGO is LIGO is like at LIGO. You know, they they knew they knew about the Higgs from the W and the Z. You know, but people didn't believe in the Higgs until they'd until they'd resolved it, until they'd seen it. Right? You can always see things at 
lower energy scales and less resolution indirectly. But people don't people don't believe in things until you hit the resonance. Yeah, let, let so, me emphasize what Andy is saying. The wavelength of the gravitational waves emitted by LIGO is far greater than the horizon. So yeah. you're not actually resolving the structure on the scale much smaller than the wavelength. Yeah. That's what Andy is saying. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so that, that, that is what, why the EHT was so exciting is because now we're getting to, to the wavelength, but it's just barely there, not enough to resolve the N equals one ring. So resolving the N equals one ring, I would say is like, okay, they were pretty close, you know, they, they almost got that equals one. Ring. Yeah, I think, I think it, it may well be that the N equals one photon ring, maybe it's not directly imaged, but, but some signature of it will show up soon. You, you, you may, there are some indications that you may see echoes. So um, light signals of, of a hotspot or some fluctuation, um, that it's kind of like you built the you built the LHC and it was a factor of two below the threshold for production of Higgs particles, and you could you could you could kind of see it, but you couldn't like wham there it is. And seeing the photon ring, the n equals one ring, is like we've yeah, got. I completely agree with with everything you're saying. I, I guess I, I just, mean it looks like a fabulous experiment, Alex, but it seems like you're setting your goalpost a hundred times further away than you ought to be. Okay, if my advisor is telling me I, I, I should well, be I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm not, you're, you're <laughs> well, let, let, let me intervene, Andy, and, and, and mention that uh, eight years ago, I, I, I gave a, a colloquium on this subject of imaging uh, M87 or, or Saj A star, and Jacob Beckenstein was in the audience, and uh, he raised his hand, and I, <laughs> I was very pleased, but then he said, you know, why do you expect anything other than GR? I mean, we pretty much know that it's correct. That was his attitude. I mean, I also believe GR is correct, but that's not how science works. <laughs> you I have agree. to go and test it. Okay, now that we're telling stories, okay, you could have <laughs> said that to Leverrier. You know, <laughs> why, are, why are you so obsessed with measuring the perihelion precession? You know, so uh, everybody knows it's going to agree with Newtonian mechanics. You know, so, so um, you know, we have to measure everything we can. I agree, Andy, but you expect from your perspective that any deviation to appear on the, you know, when the curvature approaches the Planck scale, right? Um, you mean from quantum gravity? Yeah, the curvature approaches. Well, I don't think we're seeing quantum gravity effects. So what, el what else could happen on the scale of M87? Okay, we're getting really ph philosophical, Avi, but you have to measure everything you can. That's what we do. And in any one instance, we're, we're not, we don't expect to find dramatic changes in our paradigm. But if we keep all going, you know, thousands of people around the world doing all kinds of experiments, sooner or later, we're going to get, we're going to find new things. So, you know, that's, that's our, well, our... Also, let's remember the event horizon of a black hole is a visible edge of the universe. Yeah, and, and you know the light that we see in the photon ring has probed the gravitational field right outside the event horizon of the black hole, and to see that is to look all the way to the visible edge of the universe. And so you know, I mean, if if you can do that and you see no deviation, then you've looked as far as you can, and GR holds, and and maybe you find a deviation, and you know that's the best we can do with, with uh, light measurements, I think. I, I should say that I couldn't have been more pleased with, with your answers because uh, they come from theorists and you advocate uh, experimental verification of our notions. And, you know, there couldn't be a, a greater pleasure for me, you know, uh, seeing, than seeing that. So that, that's great. Well, thank you, Avi. And, and, and to, to uh, circle back to, to Andy's point, I also, I'm very pleased with Andy's perspective as well, which is obviously I think seeing even the n equals one ring would be fantastic. I also think it's possible that we'll get a signature of it without going to space uh, through time dependent echo effects. I think, yeah. I think that's quite likely actually. Um, the, the issue with that, it, the issue, I mean, it would be great and seeing n, n equals two is, is exponentially harder, but it's also exponentially better in a way because you can start to, to make very sensitive 
stringent tests of GR. So I think that that's why I'm really interested in this. Um, and you know, it's a whole new window into black holes. I mean, I think now we're entering the era of black hole astrophysics. Um, it's the century of space physics. I, you Precision know, I, black hole astrophysics. But yeah, exactly. I mean, look, the 20th century, is, you'd say this all the time, you know, like it was the century of the particle collider. Um, we learned the standard model of particle physics. Over 40 Nobel Prizes were awarded for this. It's really a success story. And the, the prediction of the electron magnetic moment to 13 decimal places, you know, has been tested to 13 decimal places. It's the greatest agreement between theory and, and experiment in all of science. But you know, like now it's exponentially harder to make progress and more expensive. The next particle collider, you know, if it's built will be in 30 years and cost a hundred billion dollars or whatever, you know? And so I think we can now, but at the same time, SpaceX and other companies like that are gonna make it so much cheaper to go to space. But I definitely think it's exciting to, to think about what we can do with that and all the high energy phenomena that we can observe, they're already there in the universe. We just have to peer deeper and, and look at them. Um, and you know, LIGO is obviously super exciting and will also give us strong field um, tests of GR with high precision, but in a completely different regime, a dynamical regime of black hole mergers. This is kind of a, a completely different window in the time averaged domain where we're not looking at, at time dependent signals. We, we, we ignore the fluctuations. We're looking at the pristine gravity of a single black hole. Um, you're, Alex, you are preaching to the choir. That's okay, why we, okay, then, I, then you know, the sermon is over. We have, we that's have more why questions, we, actually. We so, established uh, the BHI for that purpose, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Ramesh has his hand raised for a long time. Uh, yeah, I had a question I thought was interesting, but after all this discussion, I don't know. <laughs> so, so Alex, I'm kind of trying to understand this ellipse business. Because, you know, when we look at the shadow of a spinning black hole, it's very lopsided, it's flat on one side, etc. And you yourself have shown these pictures. Somehow, when you take the projected diameter, you're saying that it becomes an ellipse or almost an ellipse to one part in a million. Is this just an accident? I mean, is there some deep reason why it is an ellipse? Well, <laughs> Okay, that's a philosophical question also. Um, I mean, let me, let me say that if you're looking at a black hole from exactly above, so if you're on axis, face, face on, then uh, you're not breaking the axis symmetry of the space time, so it has to be a perfect circle. And um, it's important that M87, for this discussion, that we're looking at M87 almost down the barrel. So if you were to look at a black hole from the side edge on, um, and it were spinning very fast, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be an ellipse. Um, so so it, it, it's an ellipse to leading order in small spin for any inclination or to leading order in small inclination for any spin. Um, so that's a statement about the critical curve. And then you have to check, again, the critical curve is not observable, and you have to check that the photon ring's shape tracks that of the critical curve. And at n equals one, it's not exactly true because you're not in the universal regime. At n equals two, you're getting into that sweet spot where it's close enough to that shape, but still you know, with enough flux that, that you could measure it. So it's a little subtle, but for the n equals two photon ring of M87, we think it's an ellipse. And that shouldn't surprise you too much because you know, for, for low inclination, it's the critical curve is always an ellipse and it basically tracks that shape. That's the intuition. I, 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 I'm not sure if I answer your question satisfactorily, but. No, 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 that's very clear. Once you said it's small inclination, at okay. least I'm getting half the answer. I still don't understand the million though, because our angle is not really that close to zero, I think right? I think that's one of the things that makes this paper, not, you know, the results in this paper non-trivial. I mean, we, we certainly, there, you know, we were trying to understand, we were looking for a kind of experiment we could do, and there were many ways in which this story could fail, and everything just really lined up. I don't know how you could have found out a priori that the shape of the n equals two photon ring of M87 was an ellipse to a part, you know, to such a high precision. Um, 
I should say it's, it's the circlips has the precision of uh, one part per 10 million. So that's ellipse plus a, a circle. So pure radius plus ellipse. That's the thing that holds to one part in, in 10 million. And I, yeah, I think you have to do these calculations to figure that out. I, I don't know a priori how you would show that. Okay, uh, maybe we can end with, uh, we have a question in the chat from Agniva. Um, I don't know if you can read it, Alex, or I can read it for you. Oh, I, I can read it. So a practical question, have you also simulated to what extent would the loss of UV coverage or baselines affect your ability to filter out the ringing signal? Yeah, okay, so so I, I think what the question is about is that to make the image of M87, to make an image of the black hole like the EHT did, you have to sample the, its Fourier transform as densely as possible, which you can have, achieve by having many telescopes on the surface of the Earth, which sweep out its cross-sectional area as the Earth rotates. It's a whole story. So we don't care about densely sampling the whole Fourier plane. Um, we just care about sampling basically a, a circle in the Fourier plane, which will allow us to see the diameter at every angle. Um, so, so all that's really important for us is that we, we have a satellite that orbits the Earth and, and you know, as often as possible around its orbit that we make a measurement. And of course, the measurement is not at a single frequency. It has to be spaced out a little bit in frequency to see the ringing. Um, maybe that's what the question is about. Specifically, if that's the case, yeah, you need to have some bandwidth. You can't just measure at exactly one frequency. You want to vary the frequency a little bit to be able to see the ringing. Um, and, you know, 32 gigahertz. Okay, yeah, I answered the question. All right, good. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I guess that brings us to the end. Thank you all. Thanks, Alex, for the very nice talk and everybody else for the questions. Uh, see you next week. Thank you.